the the fold of uh, <clears throat> the Supreme Court, mm. and um, we're all looking forward to Thursday. But it, it didn't really uh, agitate our minds when we were reviewing our performance the last six months in relation to the economy, the targets that we set for ourselves, and as we aspire towards the next uh, half of the year mm. and the things that we need to do to remain uh, focused and then to be able to deliver on, on those targets. The um, key issues that um, we uh, <coughs> discussed relate to um, the deficit that we started the year with and efforts to uh, manage that deficit and meet our target for 20 13 as contained in the budget. You recall that we began the year with a close to 12% uh, deficit. Mm -hmm. um, and then we um, have been examining the causes of the deficit and we assessed our performance so far in trying to deal with that. The key issue has been you know, government uh, spending. And that's really what causes deficits. And that's what we've been trying very hard Mm. since the beginning of the year to, to, to manage. And so what we did was to ask all government agencies to uh, manage their expenditure prudently, not to initiate new projects, to try and rather finish the, the existing projects, um, to cut off uh, wasteful uh, spending and, and etc. And, and that is what has been really. happening. And we'll, we'll come to the details. I wanted to just get a, a general sense. You said that yeah, you didn't yeah. discuss the court case, yeah. which is fine. Yeah. But there's a sense in which people think that the, the case has sat on our economy. For example, people say there's no money in the system. People have adopted a wait and see attitude. Now, can you convince me that in the, past, in the, in the first eight months of President Mohammed's government, he has not been affected or influenced by the case and that he's solely focused on delivering even though the possibility exists that a Supreme Court ruling could overturn his presidency? The case has been a major impediment in terms of the economy and also in terms of the capacity of government to mobilize the entire population to increase productivity in terms of Ghana remaining attractive as uh, a destination for foreign investments. So no one can deny the fact that the case has been a major stumbling block mm -hmm. in the way of the president as he struggled to work towards improving the economy and the social sectors of our country. The case has taken so much attention in terms of even the media that even as information minister, to rally the media around key issues such as healthcare, education, housing, and etc., and, and 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 to engage in public consciousness raising around critical issues has been very difficult. I mean, every morning the attention has been on what happened in court yesterday and what will happen in court today. Mm -hmm. Afternoon, uh, everybody is is observing the court proceedings. Evening, everybody is discussing the court proceedings. And the issues of the economy and other social sectors were critically, you know, marginalized in terms of even public discourse and public uh, attention. The same way, I mean, we can't deny the fact that uh, investments in the economy potentially, mm -hmm. you know, was affected uh, by people who generally, as you said, would, would have adopted a wait and see attitude, especially given how much attention we ourselves as Ghanaians gave to. Um, the, the court proceedings. So there's no doubt about that. And of course, I mean, there are people going around, you know, essentially or in effect telling people that don't really give in your best yet. Just hold on because this is not really the, the proper team. Uh, the court is about to declare who is indeed the proper team for you to, to engage with and that kind of thing. So I have no doubt that the case was a major stumbling block in the way of the president delivering on his commitments in the past six months. But nevertheless, you see, you need to take the issues that challenged the president in the last six months and see how he dealt with it. One, establishing a government. And you recall that today people are talking about having an inclusive government and mm -hmm. etc. As far back as then, the government set up, I mean, the president set about establishing a very inclusive government. We tend to think of inclusivity only in relation to political parties. 
Hmm. But inclusion is a broader concept. Civil society, the physically challenged, people with you know uh, different opinions about how society should be organized and constituted, people with different economic viewpoints, people from different political parties also. And if you look at this government, this government has the most inclusive in terms of composition, the largest you know uh, number of of women appointments to, really? to government so far. I mean, in ministerial or other in ministerial, uh, deputy ministerial, the largest in terms of the youth population, you know, in both ministerial and deputy ministerial, the largest in terms of plucking people from civil society. For example. And, and, and engaging them, both at the presidency and in government. Somebody like Nana Oyelita, I mean, was very plain with us during her vet that she didn't belong to NDC. She was an active civil society activist. And if you go to the presidential staffers, many uh, civil society activists are involved. I mean, people from academia, the Minister for Education, nobody knew her political disposition, pure academic, you know, very impressive former vice chancellor, plucked her and put her in charge of education. And even uh, in across party lines, Dr. You know, Azong, you know, PNC member of parliament, and etc. So clearly, and then, you know, physically challenged uh, the Minister for Chieftains, Dr. Dana, I mean, the first time in our history. So this is a president who took steps to ensure that he constituted an all-inclusive government. I mean, the issue of ethnicity and originalism, which was beginning to threaten the, the unity of our nation. He took a bold decision and made sure that all the regional ministers didn't come from the region where they have been posted to go and exercise uh, their mandate as ministers. I mean, this was accepted by the country. And so uh, beginning to deal with the whole issue of ethnicity and etc. So these are critical issues that he confronted in the first uh, few days in government and handled them very well. And then he had to deal with the energy crisis. You recall that uh, 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 ringtones of various phones mm -hmm. were changed to reflect yeah, the president, uh -huh, uh, the electricity. Everybody knows that the challenge with electricity today would be because several years ago we did not make the right kind of investments in order to secure the, uh, the, the, the generation that is needed for today. But everybody you know, attributed it to the president. But he worked very hard. Today, that has eased, and, and, and we need to give him uh, the, the credit for, for on, on that, that point. On that point, isn't, are we not guilty of the same mistake of the past, where because we have relief in the energy crisis, we are quick to congratulate President Mahama, when we do know that these are long-term problems. So because the BUI has come on board and we have a few more megawatts, newspapers are writing that President Mahama has solved the energy crisis and all of that. Meanwhile, you know that our, our energy demands increase 10% every year or more. And you also know that it's a, a long-term generation issue. So what has he solved the energy crisis or he has relieved us from the energy crisis? Well, I mean, the immediate crisis has been solved. The long term is being worked on. As we speak, we are working very hard to ensure that we bring the gas uh, onshore. And as you know, a key component of our strategy is to um, develop more thermal generation based on gas powered. And uh, as we speak, GE and, and Sogle have all committed to um, establishing more thermal plants that will add on. And the target is 5,000 megawatts. And, and we are working very hard. The energy minister has given all the assurances. Uh, we've opened up the sector. We are working on, uh, uh, on the pricing regime to provide incentives to the private sector. We're having discussions with the PURC and all that. So clearly, at all levels, in terms of dealing with the problem long term, work is ongoing. But then the immediate crisis okay. required that the president work very closely with the sub-regional leaders to fix the pipeline. Um, put pressure on the contractors who are working on new generation plans such as we mm -hmm. to speed up the process to meet the deadlines and, and etc. And and he's done that very well. He never sat, he was up and about uh, visiting the sites where generation is supposed to take place, helping them fix the problems and etc. And so there's no doubt that he's worked very hard to mm -hmm. resolve the issue and therefore he, you know he should take the credit because when so, so you should take the credit for the relief. Yeah, right. the let's, let's put but, but beyond that, mm -hmm. he was also confronted initially with major labor agitation. I'm, com I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. coming to that. Yeah. Okay, so deal with that. I wanted to, to bring in something. But yes, go ahead. Yes, go the ahead. question is, so in, in your meeting yes, over the weekend, yes. are you looking at Ghana's problems from the first six months of your administration or over the past four and a half years? I'm asking this question because then we can begin to attribute some of your we can begin to analyze you and say you've been in charge for four and a half years versus you've been in charge for six months. 
And those are two different dynamics. For example, when it comes to the labor issue and when it comes to the deficit issues, the fact that we don't have money, you really can't discuss them and say you, you met a deficit because you are a part of the creation of the deficit, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. So how, how, how are you approaching this as a government? Are you trying to have a clean break because there was a different man in charge or because the vice president he not inherit part of the blame for some of the problems in trying to solve them? There are two ways that you can look at it. One, you can look at it from the standpoint that whether he was president, vice president, an ordinary minister, or just some, a party activist, his party was in power. Is that okay? And, you know, there's a general ideological disposition of the party which shapes the specific policy interventions of the party. But then also you can look at it from the point of view that, look, he was part of a team for four years. The team made some commitments. And at the end of that four-year term, they were assessed based on those commitments and how they had performed on those commitments. And a decision was taken to give them another mandate, this time with him as the head, mm -hmm. the leader, and that he campaigned for the four-year mandate based on his own vision, okay, mm -hmm. for which he takes ultimate responsibility. And if he succeeds, he takes ultimate credit. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is a fairer approach to assessing a president. You assess him from the day that he is sworn in as president and the commitments that he made that I will do X, Y, Z this term of my office. As for what I did in my previous term, you had the opportunity to assess me in the last election. Mm -hmm. What I do from today to the next election is what you used to assess me in the next election. Basically, I think this is a fairer okay. approach but to do assessing you, do, anybody. Do you, and I think that President John Ramay Mahama should be assessed. I, I happen to have been part of both systems because I was spokesperson for Professor Mills as mm -hmm. the late Professor Mills as president. Now I'm chief spokesperson for uh, President Mahama as Minister for Information. Mm -hmm. And I think that it will be fairer to assess him based on what he does no. from January 7th to um, the next election. Okay. okay. So I think that that's how you should be assessed. There are two major issues we're confronting. Of course, the deficit being almost like the cause of everything. We are dealing with strikes because a lot of people are asking for their pound of flesh, whether it's single spine, they want some market room or whatever. And generally, we're having to borrow more money and tax people more. So it's the strikes and then the fiscal policy. Now, I argue that both of these problems came because of the budget deficit, which was part of fiscal indiscipline by the previous government. So in trying to deal with the strikes, do you admit that the strikes are self-imposed? And that number one, the way you manage a single span, you give people too much expectation. Number two, you said you spend 70% of your tax revenues on paying public sector workers, and yet still people say they don't have enough. All the management of this whole process is what has led us to this preponderance of strike action almost every week. Do you admit that? Well, I, I think that there is some sense in which the management can be blamed. There's no doubt about that. And, and we take that on mm -hmm. board. But it is important going forward that we manage it properly. Okay. And, and as you rightly pointed out, what should be the appropriate expectations? That expectation should be informed by what is available mm -hmm. and what our priorities should be. Mm -hmm. And I think that going forward, these are critical areas that we must not shy away from discussing. I mean, as we speak, like you rightly pointed out, in 2012, we spent over 72, 73% of, you know, um, revenues. revenues on compensation of employees. Mm -hmm. Indeed, when we did the assessment on Saturday, uh, 2007, the compensation for employees mm -hmm. was 1.4 billion. Okay. In 2012, the compensation was 8.8 .8 billion with mm -hmm. the arrears. And, and when we did the assessment of the first half of the year, we realized that we had spent 99% of non earmarked tax revenue on compensation of employees. And that is very serious because it leaves you with very little for goods and services, leaves you with very little for capital expenditure. And we are confronted with serious financial challenges. One is that because of the energy issues and the problem with gas supplies, mm -hmm. we've had to depend on LPOs and, and indirectly the government has to continue to provide some support in, in that sector. And that's very expensive. Okay. You know? And then when you add that to the compensation of employees, taking 99% of your non-earmarked tax uh, revenues, 
And you know that we, we did a lot of borrowing to deal with these issues. And the domestic you know, um, debt is, is significant, and, and, and they are more expensive. So interest on domestic debt alone is a major challenge. And that's why we've had to go mm. to the Eurobond to try and then raise money and then try and pay off a chunk of the domestic debt in order to ease the pressure on us in terms of you know, spending so much on interest on, on those loans and, and to also uh, create space in, in, in the, for the private sector in terms of assessing mm -hmm. uh, financing to expand and create more jobs and etc. And, and do more innovative financing of projects. Mm. So those are critical issues and going forward we need to be frank with labor. And I think that we need to manage our expectations appropriately. Is it not when also part of poor economic planning though? If you are using 73% of your tax revenues to pay for less than 500,000 government employees and you know that the figure is unsustainable. This is a long-term structural problem. So apart from relieving us from it, what are you doing to, 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 to move us away either by increasing the tax net or finding a way of cutting down on government size or even reducing government spending? I mean, what is the long-term, because it's been with us for a while now, it's been going up. So I don't think you've convinced us in telling us how you intend to move away from this long term, except for admitting that yes, it's a problem and you're working on it. Well, first and foremost, that discussion has to be broad-based. And you recall that a few days ago, there was a big meeting in Ho with Labour to really present the picture to all sides so that we can engage in the discussion, not as government and Labour, but as Ghanaians. Because whether you're in Labour or you're in government, you're a Ghanaian, and therefore you must have the bigger picture in mind as you make your demands and then as you also work towards satisfying the demands. And unless we are fully appraised with the facts, I think that it becomes difficult for us to engage in, in this. The issue as to whether you are cutting down the size of government or you are doing more revenue mobilization, so far the direction in which we have made efforts is, is expanding the tax base, um, introducing some temporary tax measures. Is that okay? that we hope will, will provide some uh, funding now, but they are not long term, they have sunset clauses and they are just for a duration and they are meant to stabilize the economy after which they will cease to exist and then we will, we will go ahead. I think that the issue is structurally how to innovate in the financing of government. There are many things that government used to take on alone. It is time for government to begin to take in partnership with the private sector. That's why our PPP strategy becomes very critical. The roads, the health sector, education, even those social sectors, you find out that there's significant opportunity for partnership with the private sector. I mean, just walk around and see the number of private secondary schools, the number of private basic schools, the number of private even nursery schools mm. in the system, and the number of private universities that are opening up to see the potential for partnership with the private sector, even in providing social services. With the introduction of the National Health Insurance Scheme and guaranteed payment for health services, just take the list of you know, the number of new private hospitals mm. that have been licensed. And you can see that even in the health sector, there is a lot of opportunity there again for partnership between... Let me throw, let me throw this in when you mention the private universities because if government saw private sector as a partner, why are you taxing private universities? Because recently, the GRE said, based on this reinterpretation of the IRS laws, the private universities must pay taxes on corporate profits. If they make surpluses, they must pay tax. And that has really generated the ire of the private university. If you really believe in the private sector helping government supply what is not supplying, why are you going to tax them? They're universities. It's a universal phenomenon that profits are taxed. It's, it's universal. Whether you are in education, you are in healthcare, and etc., profits are taxed. So it's really not an issue at all. I think that we must distinguish between uh, private universities that are for profit and private universities that are run by not-for-profit organizations because not-for-profit organizations really don't declare profits and whatever they make very often they reinvest in what they are doing so if Methodist University is run by the Methodist Church they haven't declared profit how do you tax them but you will tax the income of the workers there the rector's income has to be taxed the worker everybody's there who works his income has to be taxed is that okay but what they make out of it, which they don't declare as profits to be given to any particular person, 
I don't see how mm. you tax that one. But when I set up a private university for profit, I may get a lot of tax exemptions in terms of the investment that I make. If I import uh, items for the university, I get tax exemptions and etc. Mm -hmm. But when finally, at the end of the year, we look at the cost of the investment and then the income that it has generated, and we declare something as a profit for me to now go and spend, mm. that has to be taxed. I, I see. mean, it's, it's a universal phenomenon that, that profits are taxed. Let's talk quickly on this last issue on strike before I move on. Uh, the president's pusher, some people criticize has not helped because the president is seen as a very good diplomat and a nice person. He chooses to meet or let his chief of staff meet striking workers every now and again or leaders of striking workers. He met the doctors, he's met some of the two and co. Now, some people say that that doesn't allow institutions to work because if the fair wages says this strike action is illegal and they have reason to take the matter to the labor commission and yet because of the urgency of the strike, the president calls them to a meeting in his office, he flies his magic wand and they agree to talk. What you are doing is that you are not only undermining the federal justice commission, but eventually the institution doesn't gain the respect of striking workers. So you solve the strike for today, but the pension for striking continues. Well, it depends. Very often, before a decision is taken to invite people, very often you also listen to the striking workers, and sometimes the issues that they raised, uh, one, they will say, nobody in government is listening to us. We have this issue, and they are refusing to talk to us. They are not listening to us, and that's why we are embarking on this action. So what is the solution? The solution is they want somebody in government to listen to them. And very often, they want somebody at the highest level of government to listen to them. And very often, they will repeat to you repeated times that they have held meetings with a sector minister who has made commitments, and they haven't seen results, and therefore, they raise credibility issues for that minister. And therefore, when you say, go and meet with your sector minister, and sometimes they even raise issues with the fair wages themselves and say, oh, we met on this issue 200 times and still this is what the problem is. So you find, you find out that they are, they are talking in terms of being heard, being given audience by somebody who they believe will take action. And sometimes you analyze the issue and you find out that it is really administrative. So car maintenance allowances. And then you find out that it was agreed, it was budgeted for, but it hasn't been paid. And so it is an administrative issue. So you want to invite the sector uh, people, the agency like GES and find out, but you're supposed to pay them car maintenance. It was factored in last year's budget. There's no dispute about it. It is in their conditions of service. But they say they've been fighting for this for six months so now. So government becomes a referee. So, so we, when common we, sense could have prevailed. So we invite all the parties. They, so that we, we put everybody but in the is same. Is that way. a judicial use of your time as government? Well, because I mean, I heard I even seen news about President Maham has to direct for contractors to be paid, or he, he goes on a tour of a road. He sees that for some time the road has not been done. Then he directs that the finance ministry should pay the contractor before he's paid. I mean, why aren't institutions independently working? Why must the presidency be intervening in everything? Well, I mean, the president is ultimately the the person to monitor what is happening across all sectors, because he's supposed to have his hand on almost everything that is happening. And so the fact that he is seeing lapses and drawing the attention of people that he's put in charge to take the necessary action. For me, it's a plus. I mean, if he is not noticing that this or that is not working and therefore not given the right kind of directive, it shows that we should be concerned. But the fact that he's even seeing, noticing, and taking steps and inviting people and talking to them and appealing to them and getting them to go back to work whilst you know efforts are being made to address the issues. And, and labor relations, is the politics of labor relations is very complex and intricate and I'm sure we can spend the whole day discussing it. All right. But it depends on what you think is the best approach to dealing with a specific problem. There's no intention to undermine any institution right. in the process, but ultimately it is to make sure that public workers are satisfied with their leadership. All right. and, and my my final question really is, you see NDC told us they were a social democratic party and our understanding of that, maybe wrongly, was that NDC cares for the poor, NDC thinks about the unemployed, NDC doesn't want society to profit at the expense of the vulnerable, so NDC will come up with social interventions, and even if you are poor, you can go to school and all of this. A lot of the things that have happened in the past year make people think that this is not the case. Apart from school fees, 
fees that have gone up for all levels of education, which people are complaining about. There's a lot of unemployment in the society. You have imposed a lot of consumption taxes. These are not only taxes on profiting companies. You've imposed taxes on people buying food because you have VAT, you have the uh, all these levies that you have imposed. So is it that the gov So is NDC still? A social Democrat Party. Are you, why? Why are you telling us one thing with your mouth and doing another thing in terms of the effects of your policies on people? It is important for people to appreciate the fact that as the structure of your economy changes, is that okay? The structure of its financing will also have to change correspondingly, and as the economic composition of your population changes, that the social arrangements also must correspondingly change. I mean, we have moved into a middle income economy. We are no longer benefiting from the type of international financing of our development program that we used to have. No longer, you know, concessional loans and etc. Indeed, grants from development partners has gone down. Okay? And and yet we have to provide social services we have to provide infrastructure. As we speak, the World Bank has assessed that as a country, we need to spend no less than $2.3 billion annually for the next 10 years to meet our infrastructure deficit. So both in terms of capital expenditure, both in terms of your expanding uh, government machinery and et cetera, you need to spend money. So money is critical. You have to find ways of raising that money and it has to be both domestically and internationally and you have to go to the international financial market and etc. Now, you need to rationalize a number of things. For instance, if we say that poverty has reduced, which is what the statistics keep telling us, as far from, from, from the 90s to, to today, uh, World Bank says that we've reduced poverty. We don't have the immediate the, the, the statistics today, but as at uh, uh, the 2007, when we got the last statistic, we had reduced by over 27%, if you recall the World Bank report at that time. So I believe that by today, uh, 2013, and having moved into a middle income economy, a lower middle income economy, poverty has reduced. Now our uh, middle class is expanding. I mean, we say that we are paying the public sector workers, 500,000 of them, or a little less than 500,000, with 8.8 .8 billion. That means that every year we are putting 8.8 .8 billion in the hands of people in the middle class, and they are spending. So the question is, when you are engaged in this kind of spending, when your private sector is expanding, no matter how you look at it, look, the private sector is expanding in all sectors. I just mentioned to you education, what is happening, healthcare, what is happening, uh, services. Look at the financial institutions, the banks, the number of banks, the branches that are being opened. So all that, and they are also employing people. And they're also earning incomes that are relative to what we are also spending in government. So you have a burgeoning, a large middle class that is emerging that have money to spend. So you then have to sit and ask yourself the critical economic strategy that you should pursue. How much of poverty spending should you do now? So that's why we said that the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection should do a proper review of the social sectors identify the people who really still need you know, protection and support from government so that the, the, the emerging middle class that have income and have resources can also be able to afford their own social services that they, they may need. But we haven't erased the social protection mechanisms that exist. The National Health Insurance Scheme still exists and is functioning to provide health care to the, the vulnerable, the poor, and the needy. Mm -hmm. The social protection program, the school feeding program that we implemented is ongoing. We haven't stopped school feeding programs. Uh, all the subsidies in basic education are still uh, being provided. The infrastructure in terms of education, as promised by government, are still being uh, provided. So these are there. Even the taxes that you are talking about, the tax reliefs that make provision for accounting for dependents and et cetera, haven't been taken away. Hmm. So in fact, you still benefit from those social uh, support programs embedded in the tax relief regime mm. that we have. So there hasn't been a rolling back, if, you, if I may put it that way, of, of, your, of, your, of so social, your social program, democracy social program. concept. But what we have been trying to do is to achieve a balance. And like I said, there's no doubt that we are in quite a difficulty. We're in quite a difficulty. And these are stabilization measures. They are temporary. They are not long term. 
I mean, by the end of a year or two, mm. many of them would have ceased to exist. Let, let, let me read a few. Would have stabilized. Let me read a few comments for you as we wrap this up. Selikem NS says, "Is the minister aware that workers at some of the ministries have not been paid for months now?" This is a direct allegation from Selikem NS. Now, Kwabena Ameyal says, "Please ask Honorable Ayariga." Why government scrapped book and research allowance while politicians are enjoying their own allowances? Nash says, Bernard, why should President Muhammad be congratulated? Is he not paid with the pecs? Give us a break. This is the issue of the energy crisis you solved. You say you solved. Kwame Okoine Champo, why is the government scrapping the teacher training allowance while, minister, while maintaining the numerous allowances the president, together with his ministers, enjoys in addition to their fat salaries? Uh, Enoch answers as please tell the minister to be consistent in his comment because he seems to be contradicting himself. Pope D. Barnabas, the fit, did the retreat discuss the fit committee analyzing the massaging and reviewing the GDA report? <laughs> <laughs> Those are your comments <laughs> on the show this morning. Uh, what are your what's, what's your quick response? Well, I mean, I, I don't recall contradictions, and I believe that of course you 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 facilitate dialogue mm. here, and when you see contradictions, you would bring them up for yeah, yeah. us to try and resolve for the benefit of our listeners. The issue of um, teacher training colleges, allowances, I mean, this has been discussed and I recall a few days ago calling to the studio to uh, comment on it. I believe that the essence is to get people into colleges of education and to get them under conditions where they are able to afford mm -hmm. the, the, the training. Mm -hmm. And the existing arrangement still enables people to afford the training, whilst at the same time creating space for greater access. We had colleagues of education that wanted to increase enrollment, but because of a restriction that is imposed as a result of the need to pay everybody who is admitted, allowance and ultimately when they complete be automatically absorbed in the Ghana Education Service and attract you know a, a salary a remuneration we had to place some limitations mm. and the burden was too, too twofold because people think of just the allowance but the burden also was that immediately they graduated automatically they had to be absorbed into GS and that also comes with salaries so we had colleagues of education that could take let's say a thousand students but we could only take 300 because we are looking at not just the allowance and, and people focus so much on it, but we're looking at when they graduate and get into Ghana Education Service, their salary and other conditions of, of service. And those are the two issues that we needed to look at as government, not just the allowance. And so we try to deal with the two issues. Secondly, the motivation, the reason why we did that was because at that time, when we're trying to attract people into teaching, everybody, it, wasn't, it was a known secret that you know, teachers' conditions were not the best relative to other public sector workers. And so we needed additional incentives to get people to agree to teach. Today, after a single spine implementation, we have rationalized pay policy and you get equal pay for equal work done. And teachers are compensated relative to what um, other public sectors are paid fairly. So you don't need some additional incentive, you know, as we did in the past, because if the pay is good, people will definitely want to become teachers. And secondly, the allowances were not necessarily to, uh, to pay you and just keep, give you some income whilst you were in school. It was also partly to facilitate, uh, just as we give people loans in the university, is okay, for them to pay later. Um, the allowances was also to facilitate because they were using some of the allowances to pay their fees and some to buy books and for transportation and other things. The same reason why students are also given loans. Your explanations are good. You made yes. the same. The, the only yes. challenge is that the two comments reveal more a skepticism about government's own intentions in a sense that people claim you pay yourself allowances and then you are taking off the book allowance for lecturers. And the teacher training allowance. So it's more I'll a question. It's more that. a question of yeah. people saying, "Well, they are comfortable, and we are suffering." So it's more a question of how do people even trust your motives as a government? All other public workers get some form of allowances. So allowances is a general thing about doing public work. I think that the distinction here 
is in the case of students, you're talking about students getting allowances. We've just converted it to loans because your salary and other conditions of service ultimately we believe will be able to support you to deal with the loans issue. But when it comes to um, university lecturers, I think that the discussion has been around how to ensure that lecturers are able to research and support the economy overall. And the research allowance was a mechanism to support them to conduct research. But over the years, I think there's been some realization that the kind of money that you give them, $500, $600, $700, not the kind of money that reasonably anyone can use to conduct research. And that is why across the world, if you look at the amount of income that countries spend on research, is that okay? Science research uh, has some relationship to the growth of that country. Is that okay? Here we spend very little. And so the idea is that look, instead of giving people $500, $600, why don't we rather put all that money into a research fund so that the same lecturers, when they really have a research proposal that costs $100,000, not, uh, not $500, $100,000, they can write to that fund. Government can put money in the fund and then they can assess it. Instead of taking $500, mm. you can have $100,000 or $200,000, depending on what your research is going to be about and the quality of the output and how okay. that can help so the entire restructuring economy. Of it's the, a restructuring. It's not, it's not a scrapping. It's, not a, scrapping. Right. it's a restructuring in a way that helps everybody. Right. The same way that we can even equate the, uh, the, 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 the allowance for teacher trainees as a restructuring of the kind of support <laughs> from, that from, they get. From a grant to a loan is not really a restructuring. It's a change of policy. So but the, just the, point, the point is that you still access resources yeah. to enable you have access to yeah. quickly, education. Quickly, you, there was a, a threat of strike by judicial service workers. We understand that the finance minister has issued a check to pay them, but they are saying that they are old arrears and that they will still not call off their strike action. This must be a serious concern to the government. Well, I mean, I, I we continue to appeal to them. I... I think that I have commented elsewhere that they're trying to use the um, 29th decision as a bargaining chip. I mean, there's no doubt about that, and they haven't hidden that uh, as a uh, key consideration in terms of their posturing. But we'll continue to appeal to them. We in government will do our part, uh, given the constraints. What is due them, I believe, will be paid. I don't think that, you see, there are two issues. One, there's an issue about whether you are entitled to something. Mm -hmm. And when there's no doubt about your entitlement and it is just that it hasn't been paid yet, that's a completely different situation. So once there's no issue about the entitlement, it's just about payment and when to pay. I'm sure that um, mm. as the revenues uh, trickle in, we'll be able to deal with those uh, concerns. Thank you very much, Honorable Muhammad Yariga. Let me just conclude on the note that mm -hmm. our assessment of the economy uh, is that it's uh, looking good. Is it um, A plus, B plus, or B minus? What What's your own grade you are giving yourself? Well, our grade is that we are performing well. <laughs> we, are, we are doing well. Um, are performing we, well. We, we, no, no, the various sectors are picking up. The Bank of Ghana Composite Index of Economic Activities clearly shows that the economy is picking up. Really? Yes. Oh, yeah. That, 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 the that, recent, recent one I saw no, showed no, no. that things were going down. No, no, no. The, the recent one, the most <laughs> recent the, one. The one I saw, the last the, one I saw was most, not very positive. The most recent one shows that the economy is picking up. In fact, really? I even heard some of your, your sister stations this morning report on the governor's statements about uh, the economy. At least the, the presentation that was made to us and what we saw clearly indicates that the economy is picking up. There are still challenges. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but the point that we have made is that the measures that we have put in place are yielding results. Um, we are being fiscally prudent, more and more fiscally prudent. We are being more innovative in, in financing government expenditure. We are reducing the, the cost of uh, borrowing to, to government. We are making more money available in, for the private sector in, in, in the banks. And we are cutting down on, on wasteful spending. We are reprioritizing government projects and, and focusing on key strategic projects especially in the area of infrastructure. And we want to engage in very serious dialogue with labor around the issue of, of government um, pay policy so that we can have something left after we've paid public sector that can be put right. into... There, there, was a, there, was a, there was a quick one, which was like a joke, but I want you to comment on it as you go. The, the GDA report, which is still not out, and then the Maslock issue, where, you know, these are two separate institutions which have come under different kinds of review 
<laughs> so the, the text about the Gina report, you've still not made it public. And you say you are working on it. And then of course, we know that there was another controversy with Maslock as well. What's the latest with that? Did that also come up during your discussions at the media review? Well, I mean, the media review generally, our uh, commitment to um, combat corruption, abuse of office, and wasteful spending was generally discussed and the various initiatives and, and measures. The, the, the GIDA report, as the president promised, will definitely be out. Uh, and so let's just um, uh, wait. It will be out, and I believe very soon. <laughs> so there's no doubt about that being out. And whatever measures the president intends to take to address the issues raised in the report, mm. I can assure you. Uh, Maslock, the, the work um, has gone on for a while. I need to follow up and find out uh, what measures you recall that the CEO was asked to step aside mm -hmm. whilst work went on in terms of um, what the allegations were. But a few that I, I heard about it and, and what I know about it relates to some allegations that um, a company that had some relationship with um, uh, people close to the CEO were involved in assessing some of the funds and, and, and doing business with it. Um, I have my doubts as to exactly what aspect of it really is improper. And then also we we are not told that there was embezzlement as such. I am told that the company has has paid the the, the money, uh, what it took to do business. That that whole mass lot setup is meant to facilitate uh, small companies having access to uh, funding at lower cost to be able to mm. invest in small businesses. If that was what was done and if um, they went through the, the internal processes for approvals and etc. I'm sure um, we'll get to know in, in the report and a decision taken. You. Otherwise, I want to assure you that uh, we are uh, firmly on the ground and, and, and out and about and addressing the issues. Are you nervous uh, about the, the Supreme Court? <laughs> are you nervous? Oh, not at all. I can assure you. I mean, I heard you having all sort of discussions about yeah. whether or not the discussion around peace during and after the election is proper. I think that it's good that people are reminding themselves of the need to remain peaceful and to conduct ourselves properly. Uh, for whatever it is worth, I think that it has a psychological impact of conditioning people's minds and shaping their behavior during and after the elections. And there will be definitely be dividends um, given the investments that people in civil society have made that was trying to mm. uh, prepare people's minds for mm. the decision. Thank but you. the government is in firm control, mm. uh, president is in charge, the security agencies are ready, and uh, we have no doubt that 29th will come and pass and Ghana will remain uh, Ghana will be the winner. The winner. Mahama Yaga is a member of parliament for Boku Central. He's also the minister for information. He came to report on government's mid-year review, which was held at the Kupiana Center at Accra. He says, government is confident. Your own views always make the program exciting. Thank you for sending some through. Let's talk soon. Thank you very much, Mama Yariga.